One of the great success stories of the US equity market has been the tech sector, and even the pandemic hasn't been able to stop those tech stocks in their tracks. And in this video, we also look at some interesting consequences of having such high concentration of the S&P 500 in just a few stocks. So let's look at whether tech's in a bubble in a bit more detail. This is not a recommendation. If you want advice tailored to your specific circumstances, seek independent financial advice. This was a tweet from Tracy Alloway in October 2020, where she shows a graph where you exclude the five biggest stocks in the S&P 500 and look at what happens to the returns. And those five biggest stocks are Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and Google, which has the acronym FAAMG. You might also have heard of the acronym FAANG, the FANGs, which is more pronounceable, I think. But what's really clear is that these tech stocks have certainly driven a lot of the returns for the S&P 500. And if we exclude them from the S&P 500, the S&P is roughly flat year to date in October. Now, while it's true that those stocks are very large, it's certainly not true that they're all officially in the tech sector. So if you look at the categories underneath me for those three sectors in blue, you can see that Facebook, Alphabet, which is Google, and Netflix are communication services, and Amazon is a consumer discretionary sector company. And if we look at the current weightings of those stocks in the S&P 500, they'd add up to about 23% of the index, almost a quarter of the index. And in terms of factors, we describe those as large cap growth stocks. And that's because they're growing their earnings quite rapidly compared to other stocks. And as we'll see later, that's very important. So you might be asking yourself, how unusual is it for the S&P to be concentrated, a quarter of it, in the top five stocks? Well, the answer is it's very unusual. And if you look at this graph, which shows how that proportion has changed over time, you can see that it's happened on very few occasions in the past. And according to strategists at Goldman Sachs, the further market concentration rises, which it certainly has recently, the harder it's going to be for the S&P index to keep rising without broader-based participation. In other words, more equities rising alongside those really great winners. And there's a nice quote from their research, which says that eventually, narrow market breadth is always resolved in the same way. And that way is to have large drawdowns, which means a big fall in the equity market. And the trigger for that is when a handful of market leaders, which we've just seen, ultimately fail to generate enough fundamental earnings to justify these very high valuations. So that's quite a bearish message from Goldman, which I don't quite agree with for reasons we'll see in a moment. And if you like this video, remember you can always hit the like button and also you can subscribe to our channel to see any new stuff that we publish. Now, while that concentration in just a few stocks is very unusual, it is usually the case that very few stocks drive most of the returns in any index. Now, if you haven't done already, I strongly recommend you read this book by Morgan Housel, The Psychology of Money. Everyone on Twitter is talking about it, and it is really good. But one of the things he talks about in there, which is actually an extract from one of his blogs, is all about long tails, which drive everything. And his point is that many competitive fields, including the equity market, have strong feedback loops. And the consequence of that is that losers keep losing because nobody wants to be associated with those losers. But also winners keep winning, which is also true of the equity market. And Morgan Housel quotes some research, which is from JP Morgan. And to explain that graph, which is just about to appear, it's really important that you understand this graph first. So this is the price of Cisco from the time that the stock was issued, which is back in 1990, all the way up to 2014, which is when this research was published. And you can see the stock price here in blue, and it was a very crashy stock, so it increased massively in price, up to almost $80. But then when the dot-com bubble popped, it fell by 86%. But then it did recover slightly, and over its entire lifetime, from the time that the stock was first issued, all the way up to 2014, it returned an average of 27% per year. Whereas the Russell 3000, which is the index of almost all of the US stocks, only returned 8% over that period. So in this case, which is quite unusual, this stock outperformed the broader market over its entire lifetime. 
So all the returns we'll be looking at are these lifetime returns. Now, some of these stocks don't make it over that entire period, either because the company goes bankrupt or it gets acquired. So bear in mind, these are lifetime returns relative to the broad Russell 3000 market. And in this case, that excess return would be 27% minus 8%, which is 19%. So underneath me here, you can see they've bucketed up the returns, the lifetime excess returns for all of the stocks in the Russell 3000 over a huge period of time from 1980 to 2014. And what's quite surprising is that the typical stock or the median stock return is going to be a huge underperformance relative to the broad market. In fact, the median lifetime excess return relative to the Russell 3000 was minus 54%. And in fact, it's even more surprising that two thirds of the excess returns are negative. So if you'd have randomly chosen one of those stocks in the Russell 3000, there's a two thirds chance that you'd have underperformed. And the reason why is that a lot of the performance of the index is driven by a few spectacular returns. And those spectacular outperformers were quite rare. It was only 7% of the stocks where the returns were more than two standard deviations above average. So the upshot of this is really interesting. The first thing is that it's very difficult to pick those outperforming stocks, which we already knew. That's why active managers have such a hard time. But it also plays to Jack Bogle's famous quote, which is that if you can't find the needle in a haystack, these outperformers, then just buy the whole stack. Because then at least you'll include those incredible outperformers in your portfolio. But to Morgan Housel's point, it's always been the case that it's the tail of extremely well-performing stocks that drives a lot of index returns. So if it is these large cap growth stocks which are generating the returns, then the question is, is this like the dot-com bubble in 2000? Is it about to pop? Well, probably not. If we zoom in on this graph, I'll take this table and I've actually made it a bit bigger here so you can see it. But the weight of tech in the S&P 500 at the tech bubble peak was about 34%. And yet the contribution to profits or earnings per share was only 16.3%. Whereas currently the weight is a little bit higher than the earnings per share contribution, but it's nowhere near as extreme as it was back in 2001. In other words, the reason why these stocks are doing well is because they've generated a lot of earnings growth. And as a proportion of the earnings in the S&P 500, they've earned their place in the index. So now let's look a bit more at earnings growth. This data from FactSet shows how much earnings have grown year on year for the S&P 500. Notice how in this period in 2019, there was almost no year on year growth whatsoever. And in fact, that's why I sold half of my equity position in February 2020. But you can also very clearly see the effect of the pandemic here, which is a 14% fall in earnings year on year in Q1. And hopefully that's going to bottom out as a 32% fall in Q2. Then in Q3 and Q4, the year on year growth will start to abate and we should get back to year on year growth according to earnings forecasts, which are here visible in red, by the beginning of 2021. Although admittedly, that's off a very low base. But these graphs show the trailing 12-month earnings per share for all of those large cap growth stocks that we've been talking about. And what's very clear is that they've had nothing like the impact on their earnings which other companies have suffered in the broader S&P index. And that certainly explains some of their resilience. These have simply been companies whose business model has done incredibly well through the crisis. While we were in lockdown, we carried on using their products. If anything, we've used them more. So this is the year-on-year -year earnings growth in the S&P 500 broken down by sector. So you can see for the S&P 500 as a whole, in Q2, there was a 32% year-on-year fall in earnings per share. But there's a huge difference in the earnings per share growth if you look across different sectors, with energy and industrials and consumer discretionary being hurt most of all. And in fact, if I plot that Q2 earnings growth on the x-axis versus the return on the iShares sector ETFs, which correspond to those sectors, you can see that there's a rough positive correlation. So sectors where there's been almost no fall or a slight rise in earnings have done much better than sectors which have been hard hit 
in terms of earnings growth. And you can see that energy is the real straggler here, and that's because of the fall in the price of oil. And in this tweet by Sonu Varghese, he breaks down the sector contributions to the S&P 500's return. And if I blow up this table on the left-hand side so that it's slightly easier to read, you can see that the contributions from the sectors which have been least hit have been the greatest. So that's information technology, but interestingly not consumer discretionary. And I suspect that's because of the contribution of Amazon, which falls into this sector. But energy and financials, which were very hard hit, have been a drag on the index, as have real estate, utilities and industrials. And Nathan Tankers published a great article entitled The Stock Market is Less Disconnected from the Real Economy Than You Think, where he broke down the stocks in the S&P 500 according to their sales growth. And if the sales growth was greater than 20%, the stocks gave the greatest returns. Whereas companies where the sales growth had fallen had the largest negative returns. So it's certainly not the case that this is a crazy bubble which is not based on fundamentals. What the equity market's doing is rewarding companies which have managed to grow their sales and grow their bottom line. And although it is the case that the S&P valuation, the forward valuation, is almost at record highs, almost as high as it was during the dot-com bubble, if we strip out those FAAMG stocks, the valuation for the average S&P 500 stock is much more reasonable. In fact, it's not much more than the long-term average, which is about 16. And although the PE difference, which is attributable to those five big stocks, is certainly creeping upwards, it's kind of understandable that people are willing to pay a premium for companies which can grow their earnings through this pandemic. And again, there's a nice quote from Goldman Sachs via Zero Hedge. Clearly, Goldman thinks that these FAMG stocks benefit from secular, that's long-term, trends, and that the coronavirus has simply been the catalyst to speed up those long-term trends. And that would be things such as cloud spending and e-commerce, as more of us shop online. And what it's done is allow these companies to increase their market share in their respective markets. Now, a really interesting point is that this concentration could also be a trigger for factor rotation. If we go back to that graph of the concentration of the top five companies in the S&P 500, we can identify four historic peaks in that concentration. And if we look at the returns of factors in the US, and the factor at the top is value versus growth, so this is where the cheap companies outperform growth companies, which was the case for a very long period of time leading up to the global financial crisis, but has pretty much not been the case since then, and has certainly not been the case over the last year or two, when value has hugely underperformed growth. But what's interesting is that those peaks in concentration often coincide with a reversal of the momentum in in the story of value versus growth. So if you're a value investor, and let's face it, you're probably pretty miserable in 2020, this could be a ray of hope. But what's difficult is that we may not have reached the peak in concentration yet. Notice that the peak has to be passed in order for this rotation to happen. And although the relationship is weaker, there also seems to be a relationship between small cap versus large cap and these peaks in concentration. So while there have been several years in which these large caps have dominated small caps, there could also be a reversal in that trend. So what could be the trigger that could pop this bubble? Certainly one of those triggers could be legal. An antitrust committee in the US has just published a very long report looking at competition in digital markets. And Gerald Nadler, who's the chairman of the committee, is fairly scathing. He says that companies that were once scrappy underdog startups that challenged the status quo have become the kind of monopolies we last saw in the era of oil barons and railroad tycoons. And you can certainly see what they mean. These are the number of monthly active persons who are people who regularly check in in their account on these digital platforms. Bear in mind that the global population is about 7.8 billion people, but almost 2.5 billion people check in on YouTube on a monthly basis. That's about one in three people who live on the planet. WhatsApp isn't far behind, and Facebook is not far behind WhatsApp. And if we look at something like market share for search, it's very clear that Google completely dominates this space. And given the polarised political situation in the US at the moment, it's amazing that there's consensus across parties in this Google antitrust case. 
in which the US Department of Justice has accused Google of suppressing competition in internet search. And the prosecutors have called the tech group a monopoly gatekeeper for the internet. But I suspect it's not just going to be Google which is in the firing line. The other tech companies are also in the crosshairs of that committee. And it could be that this kind of legislation could force those companies to break up because they're seen as being monopolistic. And that could be the trigger which ends this large cap growth trend which we've seen for many years now. So I hope you enjoyed that video. If you do want to join our community and see all the goodies that you get, then just go to patreon.com slash pensioncraft. And remember, you can also get our free weekly market roundup. You can see the link beside me. Just go to pensioncraft.com slash market roundup. And as always, thank you for listening.